Welcome back. In this episode of Oxygen Not Included, we're going to be taking our very first look at cooling down steam geysers so that we can get some manageable clean water temperatures. This is a request that many of you guys have left me down here in the comment section below. And matter of fact, it's probably one of the most important things for long-term survivals here in Oxygen Not Included because a lot of things can be built to be self-sustaining, but heat death is a real problem. So the real question here is how do we remove heat from our environment? And this is gonna be a multi-part series, but today we're only gonna take a look at water. I've been working on this for a couple of days and I'm excited here. So let me show you what we have. We have uh, three different things. We've got equipment that has set output temperatures. We can take advantage of that. We also have magical wheeze warts, which we know magically cools stuff and delete heat all on their own and then there's the third more mysterious thing and that is self-cooling thermal regulators now while i'm not going to get into all of that let's kind of highlight the main points here so the temperature of this water that is coming out of this steam geyser in this case is at 90 degrees celsius this can get just about up to 100 degrees celsius it's very very hot now, I spent all of yesterday trying to turn this thing into an ice cube, and I can tell you what, it's very, very difficult. I made a lot of progress, but I never turned it into an ice cube. Anyhow, <laughs> that's, a, that's a design challenge for the future. So this water right now is coming out at 90 degrees Celsius, and it's running through a shower, and in this case, a toilet as well. Now, when these duplicants come on over here to use the shower or the toilet, what we'll see is that the temperature that's going into it Will actually be the same amount of temperature that's coming out of it however it's going to convert from clean water into polluted water all right so here we have a duplicate that has just used the toilet and what we can see is we're getting a little bit of water polluted water at 90 degrees celsius that's coming out of that toilet so it's been converted into polluted water that polluted water can then get pumped into a water purifier now watch what happens once we run this through the water purifier its temperature has now dropped to 40 degrees Celsius. This is one of the pieces of equipment that has an output temperature that is fixed. Now, if you take a more scientific look at what's just happened there, this contains 12.7 kilograms worth of liquid. Now, we've just dropped that from 90 degrees Celsius all the way down to 40 degrees Celsius. The amount of power that, that it would have taken to cool that down is absolutely enormous. To give you an idea, that's 2.65 megajoules worth of energy. So that right there is the most direct and efficient method for cooling down water from a steam geyser into water that's going to be 40 degrees Celsius. So why is it so important to cool down the water? Well, if you're using the electrolyzer to make all the oxygen in your base, or a majority of it, if you pump in really, really hot water to your electrolyzer, it's going to give off really hot oxygen and hydrogen. So if you look at this chamber right here, which is plum plumbed directly into the steam geyser, look at that. That's 68.9 degrees Celsius. Now don't get me wrong, we can cool that down using some other methods such as thermoregulators. Now when you start to look at thermoregulators, they're a little bit weird. And what I believe is happening when you're dealing with a thermoregulator is the amount of heat energy that it's pulling out of the gas, it's also putting into itself and then radiating into whatever is around it. Now this is all based on a form post on the website, you know, oxygen not included forms about net cooling right here where people have really looked into the code and everything to see that these things have a zero sum or whatever net cooling. So they cool about as much as they heat. Now thermoregulators are a great tool for cooling things down. However, they obviously need to be cooled themselves. Now with that in mind, I know of three different ways to net cool a thermoregulator for a loss. And that is one, using wheeze warts, which is kind of a magical item in the game. You can just kind of place it in there and that cool stuff down. The second is using liquid. Now, in order to have liquid, what you want to use to cool that down is polluted water. If we take a look at water here, you can see the inlet temperature here is at 90 degrees Celsius or just about. And then I'm using an air scrubber. So I'm converting carbon dioxide into polluted water, essentially and that polluted water is at 40 degrees Celsius. So I'm going from 90 to 40, just like we did using the water purifier, but in this case, that's going to be polluted water. So that polluted water could be pumped back up to some thermoregulators, and that gives you all of that heat capacity. We already talked about how much that was. So that's a pretty significant amount of you know, thermal energy that you could use and transfer out of that using a thermoregulator to do that work. That makes sense? 
Now, by the time that polluted water is done cooling down your thermoregulators, maybe you're using it at 40 degrees Celsius and you heat it up to just about 100 degrees Celsius, you can then run it into a fertilizer maker to delete it and turn it into fertilizer and natural gas, which you can then pump and make more energy out of. You've seen me use this same exact method in my natural gas generator power plant, and I have a couple of videos on that as well. The third and final method for cooling down a thermoregulator is to have them cool themselves, which supposedly shouldn't be possible. However, it is actually possible, and you can see it working right here if I just show you the temperatures. This thermoregulator setup right now is cooling itself plus liquid that's coming directly in from the steam geyser over here at 90 degrees Celsius, and it's outputting over here at 25 degrees Celsius. So this is a method that whether you're using polluted water, wheeze warts, or a self-cooling system to cool down thermoregulators, you need to be able to drop that temperature even further to something that's better than 40 degrees Celsius. So this is from 40 down, once it's, you know, less efficient or more efficient or whatever we want to talk about you want to get that water down to a much lower temperature boom this is how you do it right so you have thermal regulators up here they're cooled by some method and then down here what I have is shower coolers baby that's straight from the hydrogen bubbler systems where we were turning oxygen into liquid oxygen and I showed the showers well guess what they're back the reason they're back is because there's such a large area and you can make them out of wolframite so therefore they have this massive thermal conductivity so they're very very good at transferring that heat energy from the water into the air here and that air is being cooled by these thermal regulators so as far as the details for this system right here, you can see that I have the showers, that's transferring the heat or the majority of the heat. I also have a liquid pump that's exiting and the liquid in, you can see it's coming straight on over from the st steam geyser over here. So it's dripping into two different places. One is dripping onto a thermal switch that allows this pump to turn on and off throughout the day so that it doesn't constantly run because that wouldn't be beneficial at all at all. I get in really hot water, you can see the temperature now is going to go up and then throughout this day the temperature is going to drop back down and this switch over here will exit once it's reached 28.7 degrees Celsius right there. So I can control just how much I'm dropping that temperature. But this system is dropping it from 90 degrees Celsius down to whatever I want it to. The hydro switch also turns off the pump over here so that I don't build up too much liquid because this pump could put out a lot more liquid than this system is capable of cooling and then it would just become heat soaked and not work and stuff would flood. As far as the gas system goes, you can see I have my air pump right here and that's just running up through four thermoregulators in this system right here which are hooked up in series. As far as the gas that's within this chamber, mm, this is the secret to how it's self-cooling, is that it is mostly oxygen except for the top layer up here is hydrogen. Now based on what I've read from the forms, this probably shouldn't really be all that possible. However, it is possible. So let's take a look at just the thermal regulators themselves without all this liquid equipment around it. Okay, so in order to set up thermal regulators in such a way that they are self-cooling, this is going to be what you need. You need to have a chamber that is nine tiles tall. It'll be four on top, four on bottom with gas permeable or a mesh tile in between the two zones. You are also going to want to use at least three thermal regulators. It does work a little bit with two, not so much with one, but three or more happens to be kind of the key numbers there. As far as the mesh tiles that go inside this, well, you can make it really whatever you want to do. Use, I'm going to use gold amalgam because that's a, a good thing to go with. The thermal regulators, I've always made them of gold amalgam as well. That seems to be a, a good way to go. For the gas pump, I'll use gold amalgam and it's going to be placed right down here in the bottom. You can move this around a little bit, but more or less just in the bottom is anywhere you know good. Then you're going to want to run the insulated pipes to the inlets and then hook these up in series so that the gas that's entering here is going to be dropped down in temperature multiple times before exiting back into this chamber. You're going to want to place the gas vent 
one tile above these thermoregulators. The reason it's going to be here is because that hydrogen is going to be at the top layer up here. And if you don't have that top layer up there, you can end up deleting some of the hydrogen you have there because it's fighting for space as it's coming out of this gas vent. So by failing to do this, not only would you break the laws of thermodynamics, you would also be deleting mass because you're destroying hydrogen or oxygen as they're fighting for that tile space. So yeah, you're, you're doing all kinds of magic. So place it right there, that way it gives it a little bit of a buffer zone. Now here's the important part, the gases that are inside of this chamber. To be honest, you can use just about any gas you want, but there's a reason I use hydrogen and oxygen. For the one reason, hydrogen and oxygen both have good thermal properties, and they're also capable of going to a very low temperature before they liquid become a liquid. You can use carbon dioxide and hydrogen, you can also use potentially a little bit of helium and hydrogen and all kinds of fun stuff, but I found the best results to be hydrogen and oxygen. Now just to kind of prove my point, I'm going to fill this chamber with oxygen and then I will let it run and you'll see that its temperature should not really change at all. So right now it's 46.7 degrees Celsius and if I let this run, you'll see that this chamber should not really change in temperature. You can see that it's cold up here, about 11 degrees Celsius, but by the time it's made its way past these thermoregulator, its temperature is going to even back out. So look at this, it's still 46 degrees Celsius right there. So it's not making its way past this. It's really not doing any good for anybody. All right, so I filled this chamber with hydrogen, so I should get a little bit more thermal energy. However, what we're going to see is that it's going to have the exact same results because no matter what gas you're running through here, the system doesn't want to allow energy to be removed from this system. If anything, it's probably just getting a little bit hotter because of this gas pump. So you can see here, this is not ending up like the chamber on the right, which is nice and cold. Look at that, about 0.8 degrees Celsius over here. So here's the trick to making this work. Inside of here, I'm going to have eight parts oxygen and one part hydrogen. And as you can tell over here, the stuff that comes out of an electrolyzer is about the exact same ratio. So pump that in here like this, and you're good to go. Watch what happens when I enable this now. We can see the temperature is still about 46.9 degrees Celsius, but watch as this plays out over the next cycle or so. So you can see here, the temperature now is dropping and it's consistently dropping. Now you do have to pay attention to where you put this gas vent because this thermoregulator, the ones that are farther away from this gas vent are going to get a little, a little bit hotter, but the net cooling is happening here. Now the oxygen is pretty much the only thing that's being pumped through this chamber. And since all of this had one kilogram of uh, gas inside of here, there's enough gas to keep this pump happy. That's also important. If you have a low amount of volume inside of this chamber, you're not gonna get as much cooling potential out of it. So now that I've let this run for just uh, about three quarters of a cycle now, it's down to six degrees Celsius. So it's cooled a whole bunch. So you can either pump your oxygen in here and directly cool that oxygen, or you can also cool other thermal regulators for an air conditioning unit, or as we saw over here, using thermal conductive materials, cool water. So that right there is the most direct method that I have found for cooling things down for a net loss. Okay, so for the last part of this video, I wanna do a quick test of this little system right here, which uses four thermoregulators, you know, and a gas pump, and then a couple of liquid pumps here, just to see how much this system can cool liquid that is 90 degrees Celsius down to 25 degrees Celsius. Just how much of that can it process in a day? Keep in mind though, that if we are bringing this in at 40 degrees Celsius, man, it doesn't have to go that much further. So it'd be way more efficient, but I just wanna see from a benchmark standpoint, just how much energy does it take to how much cold water can we get? Okay, so here are the results of the system on the left. After 10 cycles right here, this used an average of 1,192 watts or 715 kilojoules of energy. Each day was able to process from 90 degrees Celsius down to about 25 degrees Celsius, 68.26 kilograms of water. However, here's where the really interesting part is. If you do the math on what it takes to drop that water in temperature as far as I did at that quantity, what you'll find out is that 
it should take about 18.4 megajoules of energy. However, I'm only have 715 kilojoules, meaning that this is about 25.8 times as effective as it should be. Mysteries of oxygen not included. Another head scratcher for you. At any rate, that's all I got for you guys today. I think I really opened a giant can of worms for what we can do with this system over here. You know, cooling down your base, cooling liquids, finding what is the more effective methods, adding in wheeze warts and all the different systems that go into making the system more effective than this kind of base system that I have over here. So I like to see where this is going to go. I really want to see what you guys come up with this and hopefully you guys have found this video somewhat informative or helpful, which I think is a good chance that you found this somewhat helpful because if you can delete heat, then you could potentially play this game forever because you can't die of heat death. So there's a real doozy for you. If I've earned your subscription, then thank you so much for that. Have a great day, guys. Stay awesome. Peace. Brothgar out.